It is now my pleasure to introduce the United States Senator from New Jersey, Cory Booker. After serving on Newark City Council, he began to achieve national acclaim as the beleaguered city's young mayor who took to Twitter well before it was a thing politicians hired staffers to do. And by the way, I do my own Twittering, all right, <laughs> at Senator Hughes, and I am certified the coolest Twitterer in elected office. I'll just say that, all right? <laughs> and Senator Booker hand-delivered diapers for snowbound citizens. He worked to garner more positive national attention and investment to Newark, focusing on economic development projects and political transparency, and achieving lower crime rates, more affordable housing, and increased educational opportunities. Since 2013, he has served as New Jersey's junior senator, becoming the state's first African-American senator and only the 21st person in American history to ascend directly from mayor to senator. In his new book, United, Thoughts on Finding Common Ground and Advancing the Common Good, we probably need him to bring him to Pennsylvania, <laughs> he offers candid, personal, and perfect, you can applaud that, absolutely. <laughs> stories I could tell you. He offers candid, personal, and professional stories that illustrate the necessity of reorienting our civil discourse around empathy and solidarity. The Philadelphia Inquirer describes it as part biography, part call to action, and part ode to the people of Newark, and says it is full of his trademark grand themes and calls for positivity and cooperation, even as it describes harrowing scenes from his adopted home city. His talk tonight will be in conversation with fellow Stanford alum, Tamala Edwards, the anchor of 6ABC Action News' Morning Edition. Let's give her a round of applause. We are so pleased to have them here with us this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Senator Cory Booker and Tamla Edwards to the Free Library. Is this exciting to you that you have two senators with great haircuts tonight that were up here, you know? I mean, two handsome, beautiful heads. You know, I, I, I almost forgot all my questions. I was about to say, it must be overwhelming you. to you. My night is done. Um, all this beautifully exposed skin, it just must be. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to start, the book is called United, uh, and it's about finding common ground. And a lot of people might say, y you've gone through so much, running for city council, two terms, running for mayor, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Of course, becoming senator, why this moment to write the book? Well, I think that, that what you just said is it. it. This was a natural sort of break in a very intense uh, part of my life where uh, for almost 20 years, I was in the trenches in Newark and uh, eventually uh, came to become a United States Senator, running two elections within a year um, uh, because I w got elected the first time just for, to finish out the last year of Senator Lautenberg's term and then the next time for a full term. So once those had settled down uh, in, and I got elected in November of um, 14 for a six-year term, I said, you know what, now is the time to answer the question in a much deeper way that I got everywhere I traveled in New Jersey and indeed even outside of the state where people seem to lament to me about um, the divisions and the rifts they felt, the intractable uh, conflicts they felt in our society. And, and so I began working on it in January of 2014 and had no idea it would be the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, which was writing a book. Uh, and finally, after my editors and publicist, uh, pub a publisher uh, give me deadlines, which you and I both had to ask for at Stanford, uh, um, yeah. me probably more than you, I, I, I finally finished it. Yeah, I should tell everybody, I've known of Corey since I was a college student. We were both at Stanford at the same time. And she tells lies two about years me all. Ahead of me. I was just, one of the young kids he ignored. That is not uh, true. This is my She was one of the beautiful women I was too afraid to talk to. <laughs> 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 The first time I met him, he's like, have I met you? So I don't think... That was my question. line. That's all I had back then. That's all I had. So, <laughs> have we met before? <laughs> I have to say in reading the book, because anybody who's watched the documentary or followed the news coverage of your race against Sharp James knows it got pretty ugly uh, repeatedly. But in the book, the only time you really 
talk about him is in a moment of reconciliation when he comes to an event and the two of you end up hugging. Uh, you talk about a police officer who you had been at odds with who comforts you at the scene of a shooting. You talk about people who you had often thought were against you coming to your side and I thought this is a deliberate choice because so many people would pick this up wanting to know your version of what happened and you don't go there here. Why did you make that choice? Well, I, I think I've learned and most of us know this from there are people that you play with on your football team that you would never think you would become friends with, but because you're sweating together, struggling together, you see their common humanity and you find their connections. We often fool ourselves into thinking that we have no bond with a person uh, and project that energy out. Um, you know, in the Senate, I've got legislation that we passed with Ted Cruz. And if I allowed, um, which was, <laughs> God. Listen, there's yeah. a list of people in the book. It's like hangman's row that he says he's managed to work things out with. Yeah. <laughs> but, but imagine if I, you know, Chuck Grassley and I and others now have this big bipartisan criminal justice reform bill. Imagine if I took the attitude that I could not work with this person. You're so different than me. Um, then I would have never have gotten to the point where we could produce something so uh, pr productive. So what I wanted to do to folks is everybody knows about the conflicts I had with you know, Mayor Sharp James. The first big um, battle we had became the subject of an Oscar-nominated film, and I really recommend that to anybody here, that if you have a spectacular failure in your life, um, have a documentary team there to capture it. It's very... <laughs> It's very affirming and, and cathartic. But, but personally, um, to your point, I mean, he made it so personal. He made charges against you. You were from the CIA. You were from the Klan. You were from, I mean, the Klan. You were from but all kinds. The Klan, Klan is in white. vogue now. The Klan you is in vogue this, now. You were that. I mean, you were every, he, he, anything he could throw at you, he did. Yes. And so, can you, the question is, uh, life is not about what happens to you. Life is about how you choose to respond. You can't control what other people say, but you always have the power to choose your response. And, and, and so for me, the, the power of that, and by the way, I wasn't always an angel in those conflicts. I, I sometimes succumbed to um, uh, responses that didn't reflect my higher angels, but I, I think what we need to understand is, you know, the people that I revere, I just was able to join with another Republican, Senator Sessions from Alabama. He and I chose to, to join together to give the Congressional Gold Medal to the marchers uh, that marched across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Um, and those folks whose names most of us don't know, we may be able to say John Lewis and maybe one or two more, but those individuals met hatred with love. They met darkness with light. Um, they chose how to respond to the most uh, awful, violent, uh, bigotry and hate by showing their character. The people in South Carolina who are in a black African American church where gunman comes in, they, they shook the consciousness of our country by forgiving that shooter um, um, that, that so touched, I talked to Republicans in the caucus that were so moved by that, it led to finally, a, finally the dam breaking and them taking a Confederate flag off of their capital. So that's where we manifest our power, in, in my opinion. And so there was a, I, I, I take people through that moment on, which was really a low for me, where I was failing miserably, not just in my job as a city council person, but I then disrespect, I talk about disrespecting the tenant president, um, this amazing African-American woman president. I, it was at the worst of me. And it was another tenant president, uh, an amazing woman named Miss Virginia Jones, who was, she really was like this Yoda figure um, um, and if anybody knows their, their sci-fi and as much of a geek and nerd as I am, um, you know, Yoda, when first time Luke Skywalker, not that I'm in any way a, a Padawan Jedi, but when she, <laughs> when she meets, the, she's, the, Yoda's very difficult. So this woman is very difficult, very difficult to me, and she, she finds ways to inject in me a, 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 a reality check. And this was a moment where I'm quitting politics. I'm done, angry, frustrated, and I'm just trying to go home and, and, and engage in a sensual embrace with two men named Ben and Jerry. Um, <laughs> and, and I drive up to these high-rise projects that I was living in, low-income housing. Uh, uh, actually, at this point, I think they might have been public housing. And uh, she's standing in front of the buildings, and suddenly I just start trying to figure out what's my geometry and physics lessons. What vector can I take to get past this woman? Because she's like the last person I want to see, because I know she's going to mess with me. And I end up 
walking up, she sees me, I grumble hello and walk, try to walk past her, and then this elderly African-American woman says, don't you walk past me, boy, you know, she's like, gives me one of those, and I was trained right, so of course I have to stop, and then she throws open her arms, and I'm like, oh, she wants a hug, so now I have to like go and give her the most insincere hug of my life, um, like the hugs you used to give me at Stanford, and, um, <laughs> um, and so, th 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 you know, then as I'm trying to get away, I try to release the hug, I try to walk back to my buddies, Ben and Jerry. She grabs me by the arm. It's like the falcon had now clutched the mouse, the field mouse, and um, she says, what's wrong? And it was almost like she gave me license to let loose on her a year's worth of frustrations about being in politics, getting nothing done, and then I started complaining to her about the violent incident that had taken place at these other projects where the tenant president calls me up and I told her I couldn't do anything, and she got angry at me, and I got angry at her. And so I started telling her about this violent incident, and I said, I can't do anything. I, 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 I don't know what to do. I must have repeated that a number of times. I don't know what to do. And this elderly tenant leader looks at me, Ms. Jones, and says, well, I know exactly what you should do. Almost as if, in such a convincing way, I thought, okay, what should I do? And then she plays with me, the little field mouse, bats me around by saying, yep, I know what you should do. And I'm like, okay, I heard you the first time. Tell me what I should do. And, she stops, pauses, almost as if God's whispering in her ear. She goes, yeah, I know what you should do. And I'm like, I heard you. Tell me what I should do. And then she leans in, and, and I lean in, and she says it very quietly, and I'm straining to listen. She goes, you should do? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. She goes, you should do something. And I'm like, that's it? She goes, like, do something. And I'll, I'll, I stormed away from this woman, angry, like, I'm done, enough of this. Get to the, my, my building and I, I'm a man of faith, and I believe God has dominion in the world, except maybe one place, which is public housing authority elevators, um, <laughs> because they would not work. So I hike up 16 flights and, and, and get to my apartment, and I sit down, angry, bitter, angry at Miss Jones, angry at Miss Sewell, feeling like the world was conspiring against me. And the more I sat on that couch, uh, the more she triggered something in me, and it, it led me to do this through a course of events you can read about, but led me to do this um, demonstration where I got a tent, went to, out to Ms. Sewell's projects, built the tent, and declared that I was going to go on a, a hunger strike. And what was amazing to me about this was my heart changed in the process because I witnessed um, uh, everybody showing up, from correctional officers to community leaders. Hundreds, eventually thousands of people were passing through there um, uh, uh, students from NYU, uh, suburban mayor brought his police down, hospital screenings for residents, job uh, companies came out to hire people, and the more I pa fasted, the more I prayed in the early mornings with residents, um, by the time the mayor, who uh, 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 was not coming out, no city officials would, but after the 10th day, he comes out and what was, as you said, this, and interestingly enough, and I'm not, I have the best editors for this book, but this was written out, and I insisted that in, in an edit that do not take this part out, which was he comes up, uh, it, it's almost like a boxing match. I come from one direction, he comes from another. We meet in the middle of the tent, and I'm speaking first, so I turn to the crowd, and even the Star Ledger, uh, who I think was uh, sticking it to me, said, a surprisingly modest speech for Cory Booker. Um, and, and I just lavished him with love, and uh, when I finished, he hugs me, he puts away his prepared remarks that he had, and he hugs me, and the picture's in the book of our hug, me and Sharp James, and this is the part that the editor had written out, because I think it sounds, sounded strange to him, maybe, but I smelled him, it was like, I, as we were hugging, I breathed deep, and smelled him, and it hit me, because smell is a powerful trigger of memory, and when I smelled him, he smelled like older men in my family, he felt like older African-American men in my family, and, and it just almost like released to me the last of the enmity I might have felt towards him in animosity. And then when we released the hug, he turns around and just says great things about me. And then very prophetically, to the point of annoying some people in political factions in the city, he just about predicts that I will be the mayor of the city one day. Um, so, you know, look, we do ourselves a disservice if we don't lead with love. We do ourselves a disservice if we encounter people and immediately judge them because they call themselves a Republican or because they're a different religion. But if we open our hearts, and by the way, when you open your hearts, you're gonna get, it, it, it makes you vulnerable. But if we open our hearts to other people, we're gonna find something uh, that we can do together to, I think, uh, to do, make this world a better place.
That's a beautiful statement, but when I think of Donald Trump, my thoughts are a little bit more in line with John Oliver, which if you haven't seen it, you have to yeah. see it. Um, and indeed in the book, on any number of topics, you bring back how people coming together, even in terrible circumstances, make a difference. But when we look at what's going on, this man this week said he had, would have to research the Klan a little bit more to decide if he didn't want the endorsement. How do you explain this moment? What's going on? Because we are not uniting. We are not, this is not about coming together in love. Right, well look, for, for me it's again that, that ultimate test that when you witness things in the world, um, you, you, you've got to start, uh, at least for me, this is how I feel like I've learned from some incredible teachers that I say, when you witness things in, in the world, it's a stimulus. And, and if you just become a response to that, as opposed to a conscious chooser, like in life we have, a cho we have one choice to make every day, every moment, which is to accept conditions as they are, or to take responsibility for changing them. And, and so I, I, what worries me is less the Donald Trump, I have to say this, but more us. And what do I mean by that? Um, look, King said it more eloquently than I could ever say it when he said the, what we will have to repent for in this day and age is not simply the vitriolic words and violent actions of the bad people, but the appalling silence and indifference of the good people. And, and, the, the, and, and so the, the volume of a Donald Trump um, um, could so much e more easily be drowned, it would never have come to be if it, if it wasn't for the, 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 the inaction of me and others. And you and I were saying this backstage, the Republicans who are now coming late to the game, when they saw this rising up and said nothing, remained silent as the wave got bigger and bigger. Now they're figuring, wait a minute, let me try to get out there in front of this. And the best example I can give is a lesson my city had to learn the hard way. Uh, when I was mayor of Newark, um, it was 2008, and I go to vote in, in 2008, uh, November, you all remember, it was the, the President Barack Obama's uh, election, and um, I know this is Philly, it's the city of brotherly love, and you all, I know Nutter, you all treat him so nice and sweet, and um, <laughs> that I'm Which sure- Which is he's, why he's moving to New York City. I, and, uh, <laughs> I'm sure if he showed up at, on voting day, it'd be like, hi, Mayor Nutter, it's, it's a historic day, Barack Obama. So, but me, it's Newark, we, in Jersey, we keep it real. You know, I show up uh, in Newark on election day, the lines around the, and I have even security with me. I look, I'm walking with my cop, and at the end of the line, the person doesn't say, hey, it's nice to see you, Corey. The person on the line goes, don't you think you're cutting in this line now? <laughs> I don't care who you are. You ain't special. <laughs> You're waiting just like the rest of it. And I, I'm, I'm the mayor of the city. I've got a police officer next to me. I look at this woman and I go, yes, ma'am. <laughs> and, and so, you know, I wait in line and all this. So one year later, I go to vote in the next big election in New Jersey. One year later, it's the gubernatorial election. And, and there's a guy named John Corzine running against somebody you probably never heard of um, uh, named Chris Christie. And, um, I go to vote, nobody is at the poll. I walk in and there's a poll worker there and I walk around the table and hug her because she looks lonely. And, and then the election results come out, Chris Christie wins, John Corzine loses, and then this is what happens to me over the next coming months. People say, oh my God, why are they doing to this? They're cutting funding for Planned Parenthood, closing doors, oh, why are they doing to us? They cut the earned income tax credit, which is a tax increase for low income families. Hey, why are they doing to us? They're pulling out of the regional greenhouse gas agreements. Number one reason why kids miss school in, in, in this region is asthma. Oh, why are they doing this? They're cutting money to cities. Every major city in New Jersey had to cut back on police officers. And I, I just have to keep responding to people. They didn't do this to us. If, if cities in New Jersey had voted on at 75% of the level of the year before, Nobody would know who, John, who Chris Christie is, or maybe only a few, but, but we did this to ourselves. It was the silence and inaction of the good people that gave voice and rise to the very thing that they now want to condemn. And so, and, and so when, when I hear Donald Trump, if anybody who follows me on social media here, it's like, I, how am I handling it? Every day I ramp up the love. You know, I, I, I'm sorry. I, every, if you follow me this week, you, all you've seen is quotes about kindness and, <laughs> and, and tolerance and, speaking, and goodness. Speaking of why would they do that, why would Chris Christie, who, for all the pugilistic side of him, had also taken stance in that your state to say, we're not going to beat up on Muslims, we're not going to do certain things. I think a lot of people were surprised to see him come out and support Trump. You've worked with him. Do you have any insight into that? Uh, you know, so 
I could write a dissertation on my disagreements with Chris Christie, um, but, but uh, he's become a friend because we both committed to each other that we'd find common ground, and as a result of that, um, he was a partner in bringing Newark into its biggest economic development period since the 1960s during a recession, uh, helping me create programs for young kids from my city to join the unions, expanding economic opportunity. So I, I haven't talked to him about this issue. I'm not going to I'm not going to beat up on him until I know what, what his reasoning and rationale is. I, I cannot fathom why, knowing him and knowing what he stands for, why he would support uh, Donald Trump. But again, that's him. Those are his choices. Um, we need to come back to what my choices are. And, and, and again, I, 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 can't, I can't emphasize this point enough, and I'll make it in a different way that I make in the book. Um, you know, I am here, my parents made it clear to my brother and I that we were here because, not because of our own hard work and, and well-being. Plus, trust me, when I was a teenager, I don't care any of you who have teenagers here, they do, do not have more teenage swagger than I did at 18 year old. I thought I was somebody hot and special, you know, on my way on a football scholarship to, in, to the Pac-12, to Stanford, and my parents would just look at me and shake their head and like, you know, my dad would be like, boy, don't you dare walk around this house like you hit a triple. Uh, you were born on third base. Um, making it clear to me, that all of us who are sitting here right now, as great as we are, as hardworking as we are, as self-sacrificing as we are, we all drink deeply from wells of freedom, liberty, and opportunity that we didn't dig. We all sit lavishly between, before banquet tables prepared for us by our ancestors. And do not think that these ancestors were this great man, uh, man uh, uh, theory of history that these, these people descended from Mount Olympus, the Kings, the Kennedys, the Lincolns. No, we are here because ordinary Americans, just like us, did extraordinary acts of kindness, decency, and love. And the most powerful experience for me in writing the book was going back and, and, and interviewing people about the stories that I've been telling for years. And, and I was trying to fact check everything and get different perspectives. I definitely didn't want to write a book and then have a Dr. Ben Carson moment where I'm telling a story <laughs> and um, you know, love Dr. Ben Carson. I pray for Dr. Ben Carson. Um, Bless his heart. Um, and, and so, you know, there's a story that I've been telling for 20, 30, 40 years, really, that I learned about how, how did I, my family move into this uh, a predominantly white town. We were the first black family to integrate it. My father called us the four raisins in a tub of sweet vanilla ice cream. And, and, and it really came to be because in 1969, when real estate agents were steering black families away from the, pretty much all, 67 of the seven, of about the 70 counties, towns in Bergen County, New Jersey, my... Uh, they, my parents went to a group of activists, black and white, Christian, Jewish, who were in the Fair Housing Council and, and represented my family in, the, in an elaborate sting operation that when my parents went to look at this one house, they loved it. They were told it was sold. They left. The white couple shows up, loves, pretends to love the house. It's still for sale. Puts a bid on the house. The bid was accepted. And then on the day of the closing, um, Amazingly, uh, on the day of the closing, my, the, the white couple didn't show up. My dad and the lawyer shows up. And, and they walk into the real estate agent's office. And this is the story I'd been telling for 30 years. Um, the, the real estate agent confronts the lawyer. And the lawyer, the, the, excuse me, the lawyer confronts the real estate agent. And the real estate agent is so upset, he punches my dad's lawyer um, and, and sigs a dog on my dad. Now, um, I, I confess that I knew I had to fact check it because every time my dad would tell the story, the dog would get bigger. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, by the time my dad was in his 70s, it was like a pack of wolves that the man kept <laughs> in the corner. I don't know why he was keeping wolves, but, um, <laughs> you know, so I decided to go back and I, I'm going to fact check everything. And so this shows you how we have so much power. Alice Walker says the most common way we give up our power is not realizing we have it in the first place. And so I go back and I find the head of the New Jersey Fair Housing Council, a woman named Lee Porter from 1960s. She is still the head of the New Jersey Fair Housing Council now. The woman, this, this year she turns 90. Wow. And, and, and so I send a car to pick her up because I, I want to look you in the eye. And she is uh, feisty and tough. And her stories confirm my dad's story except for the pack of wolves. And, <laughs> and, and then she gives me the name of the lawyers who represented my family. And so I call, I find this guy, Arthur Lessman, 84 years old, and then this is what gave me, what gave me chills, is I ask him, 
he, he basically explains to me that he was a young lawyer just starting out. And you know how when you're starting a new business, when you're young, when you're barely keeping food on the table and the mortgage paid, I said to him, well, why would you suddenly do all this legal work for black families trying to move into Bergen County? And he goes, well, Corey, I remember we made the decision on a Monday. And I'm like, how did you remember it was a Monday to a guy who can't remember what I ate um, uh, just for lunch yesterday, um, besides the Ben and Jerry's? Um, and so she, he basically says to me, I remember it was a Monday because the day before was um, there was these young people marching across a bridge called the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And, and he, they were so moved, he came to work and he told his partner, Leo, he was a Christian, this, Leo was Jewish, uh, uh, two guys in a, in, a, in a partnership, we've got to go to Alabama. And they both said, we can't afford to go to Alabama. And they decided, like so many Americans before us, that they would say, okay, okay, there is a problem in the world, there's ugliness, bigotry, we're never going to solve it all, we're never going to change the mind of the Alabama governor, we're never going to change our mind, but we are going to do the best we can with what we have, where we are, Every little bit is going to make a difference. So they call up uh, around, find the Fair Housing Council, and before you know it, they're getting a file that says Carrie and Carolyn Booker. Now think about this. Uh, the bonds between us that are familial bonds, and in this book, uh, I, get, I get blown away thanks to Henry Louis Gates, where he find, uncovers my family history that I, it brings basically a white family. It was my grandfather, my cousin, my first cousin sitting in the front row here, he and I both have a grandfather that was many shades lighter than his siblings. And so he goes back to Louisiana, scrapes some cheeks, finds out, finds the white family that is my grandfather's, was my grandfather's father, um, solves that family mystery. And then next thing you know, in this elaborate show called Finding Your Roots, he basically explains to this white family that they have a black branch, including a black dude that's the mayor of Newark, New Jersey. And, <laughs> Bring us together. So we are so much more mixed up than we care to admit, and we pass by people every day who could, just like this person, could be your first cousin, and you just don't know it. But then I, in this chapter, I tell you that the, but the deeper bond is a spiritual bond. Think about this. I don't know the names of those people on that bridge. Some of them I gave the congressional gold medal to with other senators and congresspeople. But their one little action, one small, I won't call it a little action, but their one action on the Edmund Pettus Bridge triggered a spiritual cord that instantaneously, unbeknownst to them, they changed the minds of two white men in New Jersey, getting them to now represent families, one of which was a, a family of four, a, a kid that would grow on, go on to be a United States senator. That is the spiritual dominoes they set up through one act of courage, one act of love. We have that power every day in our lives. I often say that the biggest thing we can do in any day um, is often a small act of kindness, decency, and love. Those are the spiritual threads in our, in our world that we have the choice to make in the, when we are confronting ugliness or bigotry or injustice, that all we have to do is take one small action and not let our inability to do everything to undermine our determination to do something in the cause of love. In the book, you can come. <clears throat> In the book, one of the key things you do is you didn't decide to run a nonprofit and go home to the Upper West Side every day. You didn't decide to become a lawyer. You ultimately decide to move into Newark, into public housing. And you talk about going in to see one of your mentors, and you would pass these young men selling drugs every day, and they'd look at you, and you'd look at them, and then you'd keep going. The one day you try to say something to them, hey, fellas, someone's in your face. And says, you don't know me. You don't know anything about me. Yeah, thank you for and dropping you the just, expletives. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, immediately the adrenaline surges. You just kind of make your way in. But palpitations, essentially. And what came to me is as somebody I who... I was so scared, I was scared. <laughs> <laughs> but it reminded me, I think, of a feeling, you know, Philadelphia has some areas that are very wealthy, some areas that are not. Right across the river is Camden. And I think a lot of people imagine they would have that greeting, if they tried to show up in North Philly, Southwest Philly, Camden, and interact, someone would just say, you don't know anything about me, you don't belong here. And it's easier to keep people at a distance. What made you make that choice, and what would you say to all those people who just think, there's no place for me there? Well, again, so a lot of the book I'm celebrating other folk, uh, you know, so there's at the very end of the book, one of my favorite sort of parts about environmental justice, which I wrote before the Flint uh, um, disaster, but mm -hmm. it, it's kind of a chapter that says Flint ain't 
an anomaly. This is going on all over our country. And I talk about the story about a suburban woman who just decides to become a champion of urban environmental justice. So a lot of the lines we perceive are of our own imagination. And, and in fact, this moment when I first arrived, <laughs> so, you know, again, I grew up in a very privileged town, but by this point, I had worked everywhere from East Palo Alto to East, East Harlem, but I had just never seen anything like this, this section of Martin Luther King Boulevard um, that was just so jarring to me. In fact, as I was moving in, um, stuff got stolen from my car as I was carrying in and came back and so forth. So, so in the, in the, the nonstop drug dealing, the crack house I was living next to, it was very jarring to me. And, and when I went to meet Miss Virginia Jones, who I mentioned earlier, because she was the tenant president, um, she, uh, you know, I show up, I'm a Yale Law student, and again, I had that swagger, and I'm thinking I'm like John Wayne, I'm gonna ride into town and make this place better. And, and you know, I knock on her door, and I might have said something like John Wayne would say, hello, little Philly. I think I did say little Philly. <laughs> um, you know, I'm Cory Booker, you know, I'm here to help you, I'm here, you know. And this, she just looked at me like, like she couldn't care less. And she was uninterested. And I'm like throwing out my resume and the legal clinic I've run and da 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 da. And she just couldn't care less. And she seemed to barely have time for me, barely look up from her papers. When the phone rang, she didn't even say, excuse me. She would just pick it up, start barking out orders at somebody. And I'm like thinking to myself, like, this is like an interview. And I'm failing an interview. And of course, my arrogance is like, I don't fail interviews, for crying out loud. And then she did something to me in those early interactions when I was really put off by her. And just, she took me to the middle of Martin Luther King Boulevard. And she did this little test with me. She goes, okay, if you really want to help me, and this community, tell me what you see. And I go, what do you mean? She goes, describe the neighborhood. And I said, okay. And I started saying, I see a crack house, I see, and I just described the way I described it to you earlier. And the more I talked, the more upset, if not disgusted, she looked. And then she said, when I finished, she says, you can't help me. She starts marching off to the side of the street. And so I chase this woman down, grab her, very respectfully, mind you. And um, This is very Luke and Yoda. He has to chase after Yoda, yeah. remember? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it all comes back to sci-fi, I have to say. No, but so she wheels around. I say, what are you talking about? And this woman, she's like five feet tall. She looks up at me, and she says, boy, you need to understand something. The world you see outside of you is a reflection of what you have inside of you. And if you're one of these people who only sees problems, darkness, and despair, that's all there's ever going to be. But if you're one of these stubborn people who every time you open your eyes, you see hope, you see possibility, you see love, you see the face of God, then you can be one of those folks that helps me. And she storms off. Now, I went, I came correct. And, and, and now I came with love, which, you know, open hearts, open hearts. And I, I really do believe that love is humility more than one of the fundamental components of it. And I started learning from her and she took, she gave me, menial tasks to do in the beginning, from carrying boxes, putting up uh, flyers, to eventually I got my law degree past the bar, and now I was doing more. Eventually the slumlord in the buildings gets convicted. It's just like a long odyssey. So here I am now fact-checking, asking. So I go back and I find everybody I could uh, that was around in the mid-1990s when I show up on the scene, even tracking down the guys that were dealing drugs that first so intimidated me. And you know, the dr one of the guys who was a, a drug kingpin like I, I mean, straight out of like the New wire. Jack City in The Wire. I mean, his, his business acumen um, in an illegal way was, was stunning to me. And, and, but he's like, oh, Corey, by the way, I, I told him I will change your name for the book. He's like, no, you tell him who I was. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> um, so, so Jace, who served his time, and so on and so forth, he, was, he, told, he tells me at one point, he goes, Corey, uh, uh, well, man, I had to intervene to stop them from shooting you. And I was like, what? And he goes, no, don't worry. It was just going to be shooting you in the leg. Just a warning shot. And I'm like, okay, thank you, Jace. <laughs> thank you very much. So I interview everybody. And then the moving part for me, Ms. Jones has now passed away. And again, I know this woman. By the, by the, by the end of her life, um, we are bonded in a powerful way. And... Uh, you know, as I said earlier, I, I say all the time, I get my BA from Stanford, but my PhD on the streets of Newark, and this is one of my great life professors. And I think I know all these stories. So I tell the uh, Jean Wright, who's another one of the great tenant leaders, and I say to her, I sort of tell her the story, tell her I'm writing all this, and she goes, you've got it all wrong. And I go, what do you mean I've got it wrong? She goes, Corey, she goes, as soon as you came to see her, you left. Uh, she turns to all of us and says, that's my son. 
And, and it so moved me, I, I teared up uh, uh, when she said it. And then interviewing some of the drug guys who were dealing drugs, uh, some of them I had to wait for to come out of prison uh, when I was writing this, one guy I had to. Um, they said to me, one of them says to me that, you know, Miss Jones came down and told them to leave me alone. And again, she used this word, because he is family. Now, now, so for me, now looking back, here's this woman that took this arrogant, um, uh, young 20-something and saw in me things I didn't see in myself. And even though she wasn't going to relent on her toughness and her tough love, um, she did change realities with the power of her vision. And so I, I can't, I, I'm sorry, and I know this sounds crazy, but um, I'm so offended by what Donald Trump is saying. And, 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 and not just do I hurt for um, uh, the, the victims, I would even say, of, of what he's, he's spewed in this election. I hurt. Um, I hurt for the children that look, look up in our political landscape and see this behavior. I've traveled in, in, in January. I was in Saudi Arabia. I was in Turkey uh, with allies of ours, sitting with heads of state. And to hear what they're saying, like asking me, is this what America's thinking these days? So it's an international embarrassment. It hurts us in our alliances. But I'm, I'm still telling you this, that I, I still feel called to love him. Now, loving him doesn't accept his behavior. It doesn't, it doesn't justify his behavior. But, but it puts it on me, again, to say, I have the power to choose my response. You are not going to contort me. You're not going to drag me into your gutter. You're not gonna make me into something that I'm not. Uh, I'm still going to try to be a person of light and a person of love. And by the way, the more darkness you spew, the more light I'm gonna try to emanate. The more hatred you spew, the, spew, the more I'm gonna try to rise to a higher level of loving. And that's our traditions in this country. That's our history. I'm reminded of a line from Hamilton where he sings, hate the sin, love the sinner, which it sounds sort of like that's the philosophy. And I was reminded of something you wrote in the book, where I get my education and where I get my schooling. Yes. Maybe two very different very places. Very different places. And, and I just want to say, like, like, what people don't understand is that I think our country demands it. When I look at, and I, people probably think in this center up here is talking about love, <laughs> and, <laughs> but, but, and thinking I'm strange. But look, patriotism is love of country. Mm -hmm. And love of country, in my opinion, I feel very strongly about this, necessitates loving your country men and women. Don't tell me you love America, but you hate Muslims. Uh, don't tell me you love America, uh, but you hate Latinos. Um, we are in this together, and we, we share a common destiny. And, and, and what bothers me about our country is we seem to be settling in a cynical way and aspiring now that we should be a country of tolerance. Oh, this person's not, to tolerance is the way to be. No, tolerance is basically saying, I'm going to stomach your right to be different. And if you disappear off the face of the earth, I'm no worse off or better off because I was just tolerating you anyway. <laughs> while, while love is what we're called for, which is, says, is a, in, in a recognition that I need you, that you have worth and value, and that, that actually when we work together, uh, we can make a better country together despite our differences. In fact, our differences matter, but our country matters more. So let's figure out how to work. And, and, and this moving beyond tolerance should be our aspiration. If you look at the, the founding of our country, which by the way, I believe we make a tragic mistake in this country when we try to sanitize our, our, our history of all the wretchedness, the bigotry, the hate. That is so important to the story of our country because our story of country is, isn't just those things. Don't get stuck there. The story of a country is overcoming those things to greater levels of freedom and justice. And that makes us even greater the fact that these streams have existed and still exist. Now, the, 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 if you look at our country, though, there's these perfect ideals that were put forth, even though savagely perfect reality. If you look at our founding documents, Native Americans are referred to as savages. Women aren't referred to at all. Stokely Carmichael used to always say, constitute, constitute. I can only say three-fifths of that word. Um, <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but, but, the, but the, the value in those documents, I, I, when I read the Declaration of Independence, that ending lines, it says, we, we, in order to make this true, this country true and real, we pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. 
this country, in, in this declaration of independence, there's really a declaration of interdependence, that we need each other, the best of each other, to make this thing work. Like the old African saying, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, as a family, as a community, as a nation, we got to go together. And that, to me, is a, a great tribute to the ideal of love, uh, um, um, that, that when we made leaps, uh, in this country, it's because we, we, we created uncommon coalitions that achieved uncommon results. Last question for me before we get to the crowd. In the book, you talk about a number of things that people in a place like Newark face, whether it's poor housing, um, jobs that don't nearly cover the cost, environmental pollution, but no chapter may be as searing as the one on mass incarceration and the cost to families. You say that poverty might be 20% less if so many people were not locked up. And you talk about holding a meeting and men just walking out saying, you can't help me. I've been fighting this record for forever and I'm never going to get a job. Michelle Alexander, who you quote in the book, who's married to a classmate of ours, writes about this in The New Jim Crow. And she's been very hard on Hillary Clinton, saying she didn't earn our votes. If you look at the Clinton policies, that they have created a lot of what you saw. You've been very supportive of Hillary Clinton, who is winning big tonight. Tonight be the night, maybe the night that decides it for her. Seeing what you saw, what made you decide to give her your support? Well, again, if I'm going to hold against the 1994 crime bill, against the people responsible for it, I, I'm going to be holding on a lot of grudges. Because I, I go to the Congressional Black Caucus meetings uh, as the only senator, as a member of the Congressional Black Caucus, and people forget that the majority of the Congressional Black Caucus supported the 1994 crime bill. In this race that we have right now, there's only one senator that voted, or one person in the Democratic primary that voted for the crime bill, and that's Bernie Sanders. So, so this is not something that, in that time, I was in law school and, and did not like what was going on, was literally witnessing the, the savageness that's happened between 1980 and now, which is an 800% increase in our federal prison population, a 500% increase in our overall prison population. And it was awful, and the times this was the, the stream of, of common thought during the time. Now, I support, I, I support Hillary Clinton enthusiastically because if anybody knows me, what I've done in the Senate, and I'm proud of a lot of my accomplishments, but this has been, ending mass incarceration has been, from the very first policy conversation, literally seconds after I swore my oath, I'm down shaking Rand Paul's hand, talking to him about let's work together on some legislation. I, I have been, uh, you know, nothing short of consumed with, with, with ending this because it does hurt us all. Please understand, I don't care who you are, and this is why I think the coalition is so wide. We've got Christian evangelicals, fiscal conservatives, libertarians. This has been, in the human history, there's nothing seen like this, where we're taking the liberty of so many people. We have 5% of the globe's population, but one out of every four imprisoned people on the planet Earth are in America. It's costing us as taxpayers. We've watched in one generation. We, we, for my grandparents' generation, we got the best infrastructure on the earth, and we've trashed it so much that it's now ranked, depending on which international industry you look, look at, America's got somewhere around the 16th best infrastructure, except for one area, by the way. While, while we were going down in our investment in percentage of our uh, GDP that we're investing in infrastructure, uh, it's now down so low that Europe is like twice our, their investment, China's four times, except for one area costing us trillions of dollars where we're creating the globe's unprecedented biggest global investment in this type of infrastructure than anybody else. Between 1990 and about 2006, this country was building a new prison every 10 to 12 days. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and so you, if you are a taxpayer in this country, this is one of the gro gr most grievous wastes there are cancer on the soul of our country because it's not only wasting us money, but it's causing us more crime. Because by the way, when somebody comes out of prison, can't get a job, can't get food stamps, can't get a Pell Grant, can't get business licenses, can't vote, please understand that when you take away all the options for someone to feed themselves, clothe themselves, take care of their kids, don't be shocked that it's a 75% recidivism rate then. And, and, and then who we in prison is, is probably the most ignominious aspect of all of this, which is, um, uh, it's almost like, and I don't mean this to be too flip, but if you take the Statue of Liberty, the beautiful poem on that statue, and you read it, uh, and it, read the whole poem, it talks about the homeless, the poor, the hungry, uh, the tempest tossed, the wretched refuse of a teeming shore. It's almost like you could, you could spray paint on the bottom of us, 
give us these people because that's exactly who we're going to imprison. Because, it, it, you know, as, 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 as is said by everybody from Baldwin to Mandela, if you want to see the real character of a country, don't go to their halls of power, look at who they imprison. We imprison in this country overwhelmingly the poor. As Brian Stevenson said, we have a nation that treats you better if you're rich and innocent than if you're poor, excuse me, rich and guilty than if you're poor and innocent. We, we overwhelmingly incarcerate the mentally ill. If you're mentally ill in this country, your chance of going to prison goes up dramatically. Uh, and, and then we do things to you when you're in prison that trigger and worsen your mental illness, especially doing like things like juvenile solitary confinement that human rights groups call torture. If you are, uh, if you are uh, addicted, the, the significant portions of our population, our uh, prison population are addicted. And then finally, if you're a minority, you, you, your chances, there's no difference between blacks, whites, and Latinos, none in using drugs. In fact, there's a small difference in dealing drugs, and that's that young white men have a little bit higher rates of dealing drugs uh, than young black and Latino men. But blacks will be arrested uh, almost four times more, more for that crime. And, uh, and, and they'll be, uh, you know, they'll be Latinos twice. And by the way, correlates really wonderful with felony disenfranchisement, which you, you, some of you all watching these elections, please understand in swing states like Virginia and Florida, one in five black people have lost their right to vote mm -hmm. at four times the rate that, that, that whites do. And remember, four times more likely to be convicted of a drug crime, four times more likely uh, roughly uh, to, be, to lose your voting rights. So I say all that stuff to say there's nobody that's more urgent. I've seen the devastating impact of this on communities. And by the way, lots of people get it. Sesame Street gets it so much that we're incarcerating so many people that now they have programming. You want to cry tonight? Go home and put in Sesame Street incarcerated adults. They do programming now uh, on Sesame Street, little vignettes for children of incarcerated adults because in many of our city, one in nine uh, black kids has a parent that's been incarcerated. And so, you know, what moved me about Hillary Clinton is, and, and Bill Clinton himself, that I was an Obama supporter, I'm an 08, like, I was one of the first people in the tri-state area, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, one of the first ma major political figures that got on the Obama train and, and fought hard for him. Um, and even during those per that period, uh, the Clintons reached out to me uh, to talk about issues like this. Uh, uh, Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton both have apologized. Uh, um, I, I haven't heard Senator Sanders do it, apologize for his vote, except to say, well, there was some great stuff in that bill, which there were, about domestic violence. But I'm sorry, if you wrap something good in a whole bunch of evil, um, it doesn't make it good to vote on. Um, and, and, and what Hillary did to me before this run up to this election is she, talk about, and maybe this was her brilliant recruiting effort, um, but she came to me, and to her, to her credit, she didn't just come to me and say, hey, I want your vote. She came to me and said, I want your ideas on criminal justice reform. And then before I knew it, her opening statement in this whole election, her very first policy statement, was a long speech on mass incarceration and ending it. She didn't do this just when she was turning to South Carolina. She did this before, many, many months before. So uh, I, I trust her in terms of her priorities. I trust her to, to address this issue. And I don't, I'm, I, this is very personal to me. I'm, uh, you know, politicians, we come and go. Uh, but this is a 40-year trend that must end now. All right. So in the paper today, I saw that you are there's talk of you and the Supreme Court uh, judge. I, I, I sent that rumor out myself, sir. No interest. <laughs> oh, you, you put it out. I, so I'm the source of that what's your feeling rumor. about that? Uh, my feeling is that I cut those clippings and sent them to my mom right away. <laughs> she has a saying, behind every successful child is an astonished parent. Um, <laughs> so, so she's already trying to figure out how the kid she couldn't get to make her, his bed is sitting in the United States Senate right now. I decided to say, ha, mom, look at this. Um, look, I love the job I'm in. I do not want to be a, a United States Supreme Court justice, um, but I'm very happy that I was talked about that uh, in that way. So um, um, it's, it's, it's very flattering. What I'm more upset about is that this, we have a constitution that if you read Article 2, Section 2, it says that the president not may nominate, not only if he's in his first three years, it says he shall nominate a justice. And then when it comes to us, same clause, it says the, the Senate will shall uh, uh, give advice and consent. And so right now, never before in our history, and I know people are trying to drag out these Biden quotes and these Obama quotes, never have the Democrats 
Um, uh, never have Republicans before even. No, when there's a differing party between the Senate, never have they, from Ronald Reagan to FDR, they've always held hearings and had an up or down vote. Now I'm even one of these guys that says, vote your conscience. If the Supreme Court justice is voted down, that's fine. But for the Senate to not even want to hear, to jump up and even say, before you even put a name out there, we're telling you we're not gonna do this. There hasn't been a period like this during the Civil War, there was a year without a Supreme Court justice. This ain't the Civil War. Um, and so this is, this is un, uh, some people are saying it is, it is. <laughs> um, but this is unprecedented, unacceptable. And the last kicker to this to me is, you have an originalist that passed away, a guy that believes in the text of the Constitution should be guiding us. And so for not taking the text of the Constitution and doing this, it's, un, it's unacceptable. So that was my last post as I was coming over here. I, before I had to take the train up to come here to Philly, I ran over to the Supreme Court, took a video of myself. Um, my chief of staff made me cut out the expletives. Um, but, but, you know, I stood between the Supreme Court and, and, and the Capitol and sort of did back and forth and just said that this is ridiculous. Can you talk about your decision to go vegan recently and how it is being a <laughs> vegan public servant? And relatedly, have you gotten to try the new Ben & Jerry's vegan flavors? Okay, so... <laughs> Didn't see that question coming. Uh, so I just want to tell you something about Philly. Let me just tell you something about Philly. This is ridiculously one of the greatest vegan cities in all of America. You have some of the best vegan restaurants I mean, I went to one vegan restaurant and there was like a standing room. I mean, people were lined up outside. And of course, I'm asking people, are you a vegan? No, but the vegan cheesesteaks here are amazing. <laughs> and, and, and so I just love being in Philly. You have some great restaurants. And so a guy, a really kind man who's running a vegan cheesecake contest in one of your papers, he, he said he's going to have a vegan cheesesteak for me from the restaurant Veg in the oh, back. That's really good. And I, 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 am, I am going crazy right now. <laughs> um, so I will, I'm looking forward to hoping everybody will come and we'll sign books afterwards. But if that vegan sandwich is back there, I'm going to destroy it um, with a lot of love. Um, <laughs> so my, look, I'm, I, I'm very proud. <laughs> uh, you know, my entrance to the Senate, I'm very different. As you said earlier, I'm the 21st mayor in American history to go straight from being a mayor to being a United States Senator. I'm the fourth elected African American in the history of our country. I love all these, these like, you know, numbers, but I am the first vegan Senator in the United <laughs> States Senate. And, and so for me, it's like one of these things where I don't care what your lifestyle is, what your habits are. I just think we all should be, whatever your value system is, we all should be trying to be the best versions of ourselves possible. And so when I look at all my values, um, first of all, I became a vegetarian back in 1992 when I was an athlete, and I just realized when I gave up meat, my body was like supercharged, just as there are vegetarian, vegan bodybuilders, Olympic athletes. Um, in fact, if you look back in ancient Greek, Greece and their athletes, they were, they were not eating meat was something seen to be making you stronger. The strongest animals, you know, from gorillas to elephants, muscular big animals, not are vegetarian, uh, vegan, are vegan animals. So for me, the first step, I, I did it more as a lark, just to say I was really into when I was living in England, this idea of Socrates' unexamined life. I wanted to examine my life, try different things, gave it up, felt great. Then in, in, in a very funny moment in this book, which led me to meet an extraordinary heroic figure in this book who's a woman that waits tables at an IHOP. Um, and there, there, are, there are angels all around us if we just take time to see them and listen to them. Um, and this is really an angelic woman. I hope you read her story. Makes $2.13 an hour uh, plus tips. Um, but I basically met her because I went in for my last non-vegan meal on election day 2014. And I, if I was going down, I was going down in style. I had like <laughs> stuffed French toast and pumpkin pancakes and cheese eggs twice. Um, but, um, but for me, I, the more I learned, uh, the more my values, and I don't judge anybody else's, but knowing the environmental impact of, of industrial, industrial animal agriculture, which studies are showing is as bad as the transportation industry itself in terms of contributing to greenhouse gases, as I uncovered and I have fought uh, in the Senate for animal, ending animal cruelty, and then uh, the health issues. In fact, there's Maisie Hirono, the the, the amazing Hawaiian senator had a horrible cholesterol problem, was on statin drugs, concerns from her doctor. She decided to become a VB6, which is called vegan before six o'clock. She just kept that up for a while. Now she's off her statin drugs, cholesterol levels going down to normal. So it was a personal choice to try to live more authentically in accordance with my values. 
Uh, and I think if we all do that, we're going to elevate each other uh, because we're each going to take inspiration from each other. Um, I'm so imperfect. I make mistakes, not in veganism, but as I was saying to the guy who was interviewing me in the back, like, I don't know where the suit was made. Was it made in accordance to my values? Is it, were people stitching this in child labor in uh, some developed country? I don't know. And I just want to try every year in my life to become more conscious of how my most powerful vote we do in, our, in a year is not the votes necessarily we're going to take in this primary, but how we vote with our dollars, what values we support, what do we encourage, what do we, what do, we do and turn our back to because we really don't want to know what that, dollar is, what, what, uh, what, what that dollar is driving. So for me, it's a personal path. I hope that we all uh, do better every year in, in, in living with integrity and authenticity. I am a huge fan of yours. I loved Street Fight. I loved Brick City. And I was just wondering if you were approached at all about um, doing another show or if you would welcome the idea of letting cameras into your life. So the guy who did Street Fight, um, it was his first film. He's now since been nominated again for an Academy Award. With Street Fight, it, it blew me away, that the film that he did as a young guy. Um, it won the Tribeca Film Festival for Best uh, Audience Choice, Best Picture. And then Street Fight, um, which is easy to get online. Then he, he ends up getting nominated for an Academy Award. And then he loses, much to the ignominy of me, he loses to March of the Damn Penguins, which I think was... <laughs> I think that was the original title. Then they wanted it to be PG, so they dropped the damn. And, and so I am a vegan with the exception of penguin meat. I, um, it tastes just like chicken, I tell you, and they are flightless rodents. Um, <laughs> um, no, um, he called me up recently and he said it's the 10-year anniversary of that film and he wants to do a retrospective of like where are they now and ask me if I would uh, submit to filming more. So I'm gonna do that. I don't know what it'll do with the documentation, but look, um, I, I just wanna just put a pitch in for the, the arts and whether it's documentary film or arts in our classrooms. Uh, art it should not be something that's layered onto life after the fact. It is a essential part of life. Uh, and I think that we as a country um, should be investing more in, in art in every uh, venture, in every, every forum. And what I, I am here today, I, I joke about this, but it's very true. My father's name was Carrie Alfred Booker, a poor woman in the mountains of North Carolina. Uh, you know how parents sometimes name their kids after famous folk. Um, there might be a Beyonce in here, I don't know. But um, she named her son after Carrie Grant and Alfred Hitchcock. Hmm. And, and just to go on how the arts affects people, my father um, uh, uh, basically went to the movie theater in a segregated black balcony in Hendersonville, North Carolina, and he watches this movie uh, about a salesman in Manhattan, and he had never seen something like this before, and it planted a seed in him and a wish and a desire to one day be a salesman. Next thing you know, he's one of IBM's top global salesmen uh, in Manhattan, uh, having just moved his family to Harrington Park, New Jersey. So what art does for children is profound, and uh, I'm here, uh, in a sense, because of that one medium of film. Hello. Thank you so very much for coming here. It's an honor to have you here in Philadelphia. Um, I ran into you a couple months ago in Washington, D.C. Like, did we literally run into each other? Like, did I knock you over or something? No, you didn't topple me over. Okay. Uh, I was there, and I sat in the d judiciary hearings regarding the um, piece of legislation that you co-authored with Senator Greenlee. And you actually um, had me speak to Topper, and I came back and spoke with some of your staff members regarding uh, advocating for the reform for uh, federal detention centers. Yes. It's something that's dear to me. Obviously, I came there to sit in and listen. Um, I, I thank you for emphasizing love and forgiveness. And while I really do honestly struggle with that, with the Clintons, knowing their role in mass incarceration here in the United States, um, knowing so many people who have uh, fathers and brothers and uncles and grandparents fathers, three generations locked away. And sons. Uh, and, yeah, exactly. And, and, and it hurts spouses. me deeply. So um, at some point in time, I suppose I should find some forgiveness for the Clintons. I'm a huge supporter of Bernie Sanders. And while um, I hear, you know, the Clintons apologize, it's hard. That's a hard pill to swallow for family members who know that their loved ones have been caged away for nonviolent crimes due to the act that was uh, signed. But you don't, you don't, you don't, 
hold Senator Sanders at all responsible for voting for it? No, I absolutely hold him accountable. But I mean, of course, there are other reasons why I support Sanders over, over uh, Hillary Clinton. However, if she does get the nomination, I'm sure myself, like many people in here, will support her. And that's through love and forgiveness. So right. thank you. I, well, I, I, I do mean that. Thank you well, for let bringing me, let that me just, up. Let me just tell you right now, that if there's anything that this primary is demonstrating in terms of a competitive primary, um, is uh, the African-American vote and how important that is. Um, and, I, 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 and by the way, I don't care if your state, if you think your state doesn't have black people, like Vermont, uh, they have 1% African-Americans, their prison population is 11% black. Mm -hmm. so, so this is an issue all over our country, the disparities in incarceration. And I just think that between incredible activists in the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, between uh, uh, ministers who now in the black community get this, um, that often politicians uh, like me go to churches all the time around election season, um, that I, I just think that this is a, a moment when we're gonna see uh, the unwinding of a lot of this noxious, um, uh, as you so correctly pointed out, the devastation of all, many communities. And by the way, it's black and white communities that have been devastated by this. And, and, the, and the thing I'll just point out to you is we now have uh, Republicans getting it so much, like the, 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 mayor, the, the governor of Georgia is running around talking about uh, uh, and I hear he's going to black churches talking about how we lowered the black male incarceration rate in the state of Georgia over the last five years or so, 20% uh, with common sense reforms. Um, and, and this should give us hope that, that this movement is moving. But again, as King says, change is not rolling on the wheels of inevitability. Uh, we're gonna have to keep fighting for this until the day where we, we don't become an anomaly in humanity, uh, but we become the example of a just criminal justice you. system. I was just wondering whether you and Gavin Newsom have decided among yourselves who should be president first before the other. <laughs> um, so, uh, so first of all, if, uh, Gavin and I just did an event in at the Castro Theater in New York, in, in uh, San Francisco, um, an amazing night. Uh, one, 2,000 people showed up for a conversation like this in this very famous theater, and I was teasing him mercilessly because he's been a friend for a long time. Um, but in all seriousness, that you've given me the opportunity to talk about when I fell in love with Gavin Newsom. Um, I, I can see the headlines right now, Cory Booker in love with Gavin Newsom. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, he was one of these guys and it, it against the, broke the law to issue marriage licenses. This was before it was in vogue, before a lot of politicians had evolved, and was being blamed for losing the 2004 presidential election because of his, his strident stance. When I became a mayor two, two, two years later, um, uh, as we take inspiration from each other, I immediately, the first flag I raised in front of City Hall was a pride flag, to which I got lots and lots of hate calls. And they weren't anonymous hate calls. There were people calling me up telling me exactly who they were and, <laughs> and where I could go. Um, and I, I pronounced that I would not, you know, mayors can perform marriages. You know, I pronounced that I would not uh, marry anybody as, as a mayor of my city uh, until everybody could marry, and then which prompted my mom to call uh, angrily <laughs> and say, um, I, I don't care if you marry other people, I just want you to marry one person. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> please marry somebody. Um, <laughs> so, so, you know, this has been a huge leap that I think he was one of the early trailblazers in politics, and I just want to remind us you know, this book is all about empathy and seeing each other. Well, right now, as we speak, there are LB, LGBT uh, uh, cute kids getting bullied, uh, being kicked out of their homes. One of the homeless populations, driver for, one of the biggest drivers for youth homelessness is often uh, parents who are not accepting of their youth. Uh, uh, we still live in a country right now where you may get married in most states, but most states, if you post that on your Facebook account and your employer sees it, they can fire you just for being gay um, and you have no legal recourse. Um, they can kick you out of your apartment just for being gay with no legal recourse. So we have a long way to go, and I'm happy that there's still champions like Gavin Newsom uh, who are willing to fight for it. And I'm proud to be one of the original co-sponsors of a bill that would end that injustice on the federal level. Okay, last question right there. You mentioned how important sports has been in your life, and sports is something that could unite the country, but even here, there's so much controversy. Um, and and I'm wondering um, what your opinion might be uh, in light of um, what we know about concussions, the toll, um, how men are exploit, how young men are exploited. Um, would you let your son play football? So that's been the most, honestly, as I've traveled, that's been the one of the most difficult questions I've gotten about would I let my son 
uh, play, play football, and it gets my mom excited when anybody talks about me having children. Um, <laughs> so um, so I, I, can't honest, I can honestly say right now what I think and what I believe is yes. I mean, uh, I got into Stanford because of a 4.0, 1,600, 4.0 yards per carry, 1,600 receiving <laughs> yards. Um, <laughs> just being honest with the crowd here. Um, <laughs> Um, you know, it, it's, so, it's defined so much of who I am, but, but there is a problem. Even in NCAA football, I, I, the only time I really lost my temper was when the head of the NCAA came, and I just wanted to, I, I mean, I, how can we have a nation where a kid can get a scholarship to play football but blows out his knee, then they yank the scholarship from them? Um, uh, how can we have a nation where you... Um, have poor kids who might get a scholarship to go play someplace long way away. They can't even afford, the scholarship, they even, the NCAA even admits is hundreds of dollars short for the total costs. They, they used to do part-time work to help support the family and now uh, the, the, the university can make millions of dollars off of them, off of their image, um, but th this kid is literally uh, begging for dollars uh, to get pizza um, and then gets caught selling their jersey and is, is basically loses their scholarship. So it's a very unjust system. And so I want to see a lot of reforms in football. Uh, but as far as me personally, I, I think that um, right now, and again, ask me this, should I ever have a, a, a son, uh, I think I would let them play. But a daughter too, I would let her play, <laughs> especially. <laughs> um, but if, if I could... <laughs> This is Philly's rough. Maybe, I, maybe I, I take it back what I said. Yeah. City of brotherly love. Come on. But let me end with just one point uh, that, uh, that I think a lot of people have made here, and, and, and especially some of the questions uh, before. And I, and I just want to end with, with this um, very important point, and it's the one I try to make in the book, which is this. Um, you know, this is not a kumbaya, Rodney King, let's all get along book. It, it, it's so far from that. Um, and whatever the issue is, from injustices in the NCAA to criminal justice reform to environmental problems, challenges facing gays and lesbians, uh, bisexual, transgender Americans, um, th the problem that I admit and confess, the, the, I don't want to call it a defect in the book, but the, the problem I don't deal with is a reality I've come from. If, that if you choose in life uh, to be a patriot, which is a lover, if you choose in this world to be a, a courageous lover, um, which means opening your heart, it means extending yourself beyond your comfort zones, uh, it means seeing your fellow Americans despite the wretchedness of their reality. Um, the thing I promise you, I promise you this, it will mean getting your heart broken. You cannot be a great lover without getting, uh, uh, be, be experiencing great heartbreak. Um, what Miss Virginia Jones taught me is that Hope um, does not exist in an abstract. It is always in reaction to despair. Hope is the active, fervent conviction that despair will not have the last word. And, and, and in, my, in the book, and you know, the, the painfulness that I don't shy away from in this book, um, the, one of the more painful moments of my life uh, was uh, a boy that was just like my dad, who was who was lived in my buildings. Um, he lived four floors below me. When I say he was just like my dad, he was charismatic, smart, uh, um, um, just a, an incredible young man that I watched grow up to the point that by the time his 2005 rolled around, year before I become mayor of the city, he and his crew are hanging out in the lobby and they are now smoking pot and I see signs of gang signs on the, on the walls. And I, it's all, it's like, sorry to be sci-fi, but it's like danger, Will Robinson, danger. And because I know that they weren't stopping folk at Stanford, stopping and frisking people or raiding dorms at Stanford. And there's just as much, if not more pot being smoked uh, on campuses than there are uh, in an inner city community. And so I know I have to get involved with this, these kids. They're on my doorstep and I start taking them out. I ask them what movie they want to go see. And, think they're talking about some home improvement movie when they tell me they want to go see Saw 2. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but I was so proud of myself. I take them out to dinner and I brought friends of mine who were uh, involved in drug trade and gotten out. Much better to talk to them about this problem than some suburban kid who's never even drank alcohol. And I'm making progress, but then I get really busy. Life, you, we get busy, right? 
and I'm, I'm now, but I'm, my busyness is my dream. I'm running for the mayor election, gets kicked in and gets started, and I'm running hard for mayor, so hard that I'm barely coming home, like two, three hours a night of sleep, coming in, and the kids were there, and they were awesome to me. Forget my mentoring, that had gone to the side, but now they're, they're nurturing to my soul. I mean, I come home, and they joke with me, they swear to me up and down that they got my back, they're going to get everybody to vote for me. One night I come home, and they had gotten a hold of all these lawn signs, and they were holding out like a parade line, and I was walking down, sort of waving on the parade as they marched me to the elevator, and elevator opened. I don't know if the elevator is working or not, because they elevated me so much, that elevator took me up to the 16th floor, and, 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 and then, of course, I, at one point, I'm wondering, wait a minute, where'd they get those lawn signs from? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I get elected mayor, immediately had death threats, so they, I'm mayor-elect, and they rat me with police officers because of the, the FBI was, thought they were credible threats. And, and so, the, I don't know who, you, we all were like this when we hung out as teenagers. You don't really want to hang out in the lobby where cops are hanging out. Uh, um, so they, I just never see them anymore. But now I'm the mayor. I've got the brass ring. I am the guy. I'm going to be helping all children. I got the big battles, the big fights. And uh, I'm running around the city doing the mayoral stuff and not even thinking about these kids that I had begun following through with but didn't. And then I show up at the scene of a murder, and there was a kid body covered, another one being loaded in the ambulance. And I'm, I'm embarrassed to admit to you, I didn't stop and pause and affirm the humanity that lay before me. I went on to minister to the living, to talk to the crowds that were gathering. I didn't even think about it until I got home, and now I'm flipping through my Blackberry, um, and I, I, I see the name of the boy that was murdered on that street, and it was Hassan Washington, the kid from my building who lived four floors below me. And, and this chapter I begin with that walk at a place called Perry's Funeral Home, an inner city, central ward, and there's all the rooms are on the first floor except for one that's in the basement. And every time I descended into that basement, these narrow stairs, I, I felt like I was descending into the bowel of a boat. And going down there, just moaning and groaning, people chained together in grief, piled in on top of each other, all for a, a, a chillingly regular reality in America, which is another boy in a box. And I'm telling you, I didn't feel mayoral. I was a newly minted mayor. I didn't feel strong. I didn't feel powerful. I didn't feel important. I felt shame and guilt. And I stood in the back of that funeral, and, and I couldn't minister to people. I couldn't comfort others. Folk just came to me and hugged me, and when they hugged me, I leaned on their light. I tried to pull from their energy, but I just couldn't do it. Couldn't stay there. And so this big new mayor ran. I ran out of that funeral home jumped into my new, brand new SUV, told the cop to take me to City Hall, ran up the steps, slammed the door, locked it, and fell onto my couch, and I cried. Um, and I, I, I felt like I had f failed my history, that all those people were there for my dad, so he wouldn't fall through the cracks, but I couldn't pay it forward to these kids that God put right in front of me. And of course, I was there. We all were there for his funeral, but where were we there for his life? And so I tell you that because there's a moment in the book that I write about coming from a murder of a boy, um, broken, angry, angry at this country that where we all swear this oath, we swear this oath uh, that uh, we will be a nation of liberty and justice for all. But, but when I say those words, when we say those words, are we willing to sacrifice for it, struggle for it? I was angry at our country that allows people to be blind to the carnage going on every single day. 90 people dying of, of gunshot wounds, 120 people dying every day in America from drug overdoses, all of this stuff going on and we don't see each other. And, and I talk about coming down that morning and coming out early in the morning, coming out of my building, and I'm walking through the lobby and, and I remember that Ms. Jones' son in 1980 home from being a veteran, was murdered in that lobby. And I remember that she had, did not leave. She did not leave. She didn't give up. She, she kept being the president of these buildings. And, and as I walked out of the lobby, still feeling like I'm 100 feet underwater, I see across the courtyard a woman whose back is turned to me, and it's Miss Virginia Jones. And I stop there, and I am choking. I am drowning. 
I'm wrestling with my demons of anger and bitterness and rage and hurt and shame. And she turns around and she sees me. And, and what she did next, I, I thank her for for this day, because all she did is open her arms again like that other story I did, but this time it's exactly what I wanted. And I scurried to her like a little kid. I am 6'3", she is five feet tall. But when she hugs me, I, I felt like a little child disappearing into my mother's arms. And I just began to weep on her shoulders. And, and she just rubbed my back and she said over and over again these two words, over and over again, uh, the words that sustain me to this day, words that I repeat to myself when I am banging my head in the Senate, words that I used in the worst times when I was mayor, uh, words that have nothing to do with me with religion, but have to do with a loyalty, a fealty to our nation's ideals, to the concept of love. She just is rubbing my back as I uh, feel like a little boy, and she says to me over and over again, she says, stay faithful, stay faithful stay faithful. And so tonight, I, I just want to thank you all for coming together here. Uh, we have a lot of work to do in this country. This nation ain't done yet. And, and, and the principles of it, um, we need to swear an oath. And I want to end like I've never ended one of these uh, book events before, besides saying thank you to uh, this amazing young lady to my left who's, who's forgiven me for my behavior as a Stanford student. <laughs> but if I can just end with... Uh, uh, the words of Langston Hughes, uh, who talks about that oath. Um, and, and he says, in a powerful end of a poem, and I hope I get it all right, he says, Oh, let America be America again, the land that never has been yet, but yet must be, the land where everyone is free, the poor man, the Indian, the Negro, me. And who made America, whose sweat and blood, whose faith and pain, whose hand at the foundry, whose plow in the rain must make our mighty dream live again. Oh yes, I say it plain. America never was America to me, but I swear this oath, America will be. <laughs>